to start out here, uh, Mr. Burke has been kind enough to queue up Mission 1, so we're going to just give you a quick refreshment on the path that Paul took in his first missionary journey, which will be our focus for wrapping up today to the province of Malaysia. And just watch on the video and you'll see the path that he takes, and then we'll get into a little bit of, of Acts. Audio Jungle. Uh, Paul 
on all of his missionary trips, as you know, he first tries to go to the Jews and what he considered to be the God-fearing. And sometimes the God-fearing in the Bible referenced those that might have been recent, recently proselytized, meaning they became Jewish um, and, uh, and many getting circumcised. So they were sometimes referred to as God-fearers. Um, you'll read about them. You know, he'll say Jews and then God-fearers, who were really Gentiles, possibly converted, possibly. And then also, he then went to the Gentiles, which was his primary mission, as you know. And um, what we're going to find out in our discussion today is, I had referenced in, I think, a couple weeks ago, I talked a little bit about Paul going to Jerusalem a couple times, and Barnabas as his sidekick being his front man, you know, sort of breaking ground for him, saying, Paul's really not the big bad guy that you think he is, you know, the anti-Christian. He's really done some great things. But he was a front man for Paul, and he helped break the ice to Peter, and to the rest of the apostles in Jerusalem, which actually, that visit to the Jerusalem Council, which is called the Apostolic Council, where they talked about, is circumcision necessary for Gentiles or not? That occurred after this missionary journey. So we talked about it a couple weeks ago, in general, but this time, it happens after he completes this missionary journey, he goes down from Antioch, down to Jerusalem, and then meets with Peter for 15 days, and then has a big discussion with the council about circumcision. So that's a little bit where we're at. And we ended somewhere, I think, I don't know if we got to Perga last time. Does anyone recall the last part of Acts that we might have read? I don't know if you were the last reader, Ann. I'm not sure. Good. Well, then if you don't, you feel a bit better. Um, we're going to take off here and maybe, I don't want to take us through the whole thing again, but I would like to bring us down into here where we go to Iconium and Lister and Jury from the city of Antioch. I think it was 1349. You're 13? Yeah, I think that's where I stopped. Here. Right at 49 here? Yeah. Okay, good. Let's begin then with Acts 13.51 to 14.7. Let's begin there. Mark, do you have that open by chance? Would you mind? Yeah. Where are we starting? Acts 13, verse 51. And then if you want to read, you know, five to seven verses or so, then we'll just pass right. it on. So they shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and looked at Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy with the Holy Spirit. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, other with the apostles. There was a plot of foot among the Gentiles and the Jews together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they were found out about it and fled to the like Canaan cities of Lystra and Derby and to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the good news. Very good. And how far did you get? Because I wasn't able that to... That was up to eight. Oh, okay. Would anyone take, continue on to uh, 14 verse 7? Just read another a couple verses okay. then we'll, we'll pause. In past generations, he allowed all the Jews to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rain, rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices. Okay, thank you. 
So they were considered, uh, you know, when they saw somebody do something phenomenal, they figured they had to be a Greek god, you know, or a Roman. You know, the Roman gods, in many cases, were renaming, were renamed from, were given a new name, but they were originally were Greek gods, you know, and they were given a Roman name and a little bit of a Roman derivative. But Zeus and Hermes, you know, is who they wanted to call them, Paul and Bar Bar or Barnabas and Paul, respectively. And, of course, they didn't want anything to do with it. Um, then as Paul goes to, to Lystra, he ends up getting hauled out of the town and stoned. So what verse did you end at? Because I got a little bit lost. I, not because of you. Or 18. 18. 18. Um, so Paul then enters into Lystra, and the Jews ended up following him around. And uh, what we'll talk about a little bit for a brief... I'm going to go past this. This is a little out of order. Uh, this is uh, the, this is really looking at the first Gentile churches, which is a little bit of a, um, I guess an offshoot, a, a takeoff. Not really what I was planning on doing totally, but I wanted to show you a little bit of what some of the Roman architecture here. And this was a, a temple dedicated to Augustus, and uh, and this was you know the Roman baths. You know they, they were very much into baths and purification. And interesting enough, when Paul then got into baptism water, you know, and even the Jews were used to, before going to the temple, cleansing themselves. It was really a little step over to move them from taking a ritual bath to cleanliness and then baths for purification before entering the temple to baptism uh, to becoming the temple. And what is just incredible is, is, uh, is just the Roman architecture. Like, this is an aqueduct, and it's just fantastic. And this is a, the city in Antioch uh, where Paul was at. This is the Antioch in Turkey. And this is some of the ruins of it. And, you know, you can't see much. But it's just amazing when you go and when there's limestone, there's a lot of ruins with limestone. Because you can knock over the, the rest of the structure and you can just build on the foundation or add some dirt. And then the dirt makes what's called a tail, a hill. And uh, it keeps going up as, as we keep digging in archaeology down. But really, you need, and these aqueducts, because of all that mountainous country, they could take water from the mountains and bring it down to the city. Uh, in the center of the aqueduct. It's really unique. Uh, this is uh, called the Church of St. Paul. And uh, you can see a theater that was here. The Church of St. Paul was down in here. Uh, the city of Antioch, named after him. And this is a friend of mine, Larry Boyer, standing in Caesarea. We're, not in, we're now back. That's over in Israel. But the reason we had the photo here is because this is the aqueduct, what it looks like in terms of pillars supporting it. And this is the inside of an aqueduct and how much water it could channel. So when you got some heavy rains, it could really move some water. And those waters got circulated to the Roman baths. They got circulated to the latrines. And, uh, you know, and again, we'll throw in a sponge at the auction. <laughs> Remember that story. Uh, and then uh, what Paul faced, though, as he went around and as we get into the story where he goes into the town of Lystra and Derby, is that... Uh, he had these doggone Judaizers following him around. And Judaizers were those that got a bit of the message of, you know, coming to Christ. They, they, they latched onto that. But they just could not let go of the fact that if you're going to be a convert to anything that's even, if you're going to become a Jewish Christian, you first have to become a Jew, which means you have to follow all the Jewish customs. So when Paul would say to the Gentiles, you don't have to be circumcised. Right on his path would come the Judaizers into the synagogues and counter him and say, aside from what Paul said, here's how it really works. <laughs> you have to become a Jew. And, and they came from Antioch Presidium, and they went all the way over to Derby and Lystra. They just kept following him in all his missionary journeys all around. It's sort of amazing. They end up showing up in Jerusalem from, from way over from Greece following Paul and trying to say, you know, don't buy this story, which led to this apostolic council where the Jews who had converted to Christianity, disciples of Christ, you know, had this discussion of what do we do with this circumcision? Because we got these Judaizers that keep pushing it. And do we listen to Paul and do we support him or not? Anyway, that's the background of all of that. Um, and Paul ends up, when he ends up completing this missionary journey, he's back in Antioch, Syria. And Peter comes up to pay a visit to him before Paul goes down to Jerusalem again. And 
Peter then runs into some Jews who say to him, Peter, you're not going to sit and eat with these Gentiles like Paul, are you? And then Peter caves and goes, no, no, I won't do that. I'll come eat with you. I'm not eating any of that temple food. So then Paul has to pull him aside, and he rebukes, really the leader at the time of the apostles, Peter, rebuked by Paul, the newbie, you know, the, the young pup to the Christian faith, so to speak, who didn't spend three years with Christ. But Paul took him on because, you know, of his hypocrisy and because he would lead others astray. He already had those Judaizers following him all around. He didn't need Peter, you know, leading those astray. But that led to a long discussion in Jerusalem and to a very good outcome. So, with all that, back to where we were, sorry. We're going to go to Lystra, uh, 14, and you ended at 18, right? Yeah. So if someone would pick up and take us 19 through, well, actually, it's not very far, 19 to 20, first couple. Let's go 19 through 23, because I think that gets us goes back to, let's see. The Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went out as far as to Derby. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Draconia and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in, in the faith, and saying that though many tribulations we must and that and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And they had and when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Mm -hmm. So here we have Paul getting stoned, and you remember the martyr Stephen who got stoned. And who was, do you recall who was holding the coats Paul. for all those that stole them? Paul. 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 So here, Paul is in a position, maybe in the center of the crowd or on the periphery of the city, and, you know, they they keep throwing. How would you like to get stoned? I mean, I can't think that would be feel too good. And then go on and have, have a, a preaching engagement the next week. <laughs> he probably came into Derby relatively bruised, pretty beat up looking. But, that would also convey a very powerful message where he talks about persecution being part of the road to Christ. And you can look at him and say, oh yeah, I find that. You're pretty beat up, Paul. Uh, but he kept going. So, I mean, he's got beat up on all his missionary journeys, and this is just the first one. So from here, he goes back to Antioch and Syria, and then he goes down to Jerusalem. So we're going to advance forward here. I'll go through these slides. And... So we're back to here, and uh, and then he's going down to, I don't know why I have this. Here's where I want to be, and then I'll back up and talk about Galatia. So uh, Jerusalem Council is where we're really approaching as we go into uh, chapter 15. And in this Jerusalem Council, it was a subject I already mentioned. It was all about these what the Judaizers were following him around, whining about, which is, you can't just become a Christian. You have to get wedded to the Old Testament laws, all our ceremonial laws, if they were Pharisees, all the oral law, if they were Pharisees. They were Sadducees, not the, not the oral law. But they certainly all bought into the, if you were male, you had to be circumcised. So they got into this big discussion, and it was this was the core issue. To circumcise or not circumcise, that was the question. And of course they came away with the conclusion, no. And this is where... Paul spent 15 days with Peter, just having a private conversation with him. And then they walked away with a compromise, and it was um, that you don't need to be, uh, be circumcised to receive, to be a Jew, and to be a Jewish Christian, um, and receive the gift of God. It's by faith in Christ alone. And of course, Luther jumps all over the words of Paul, doctrinally, you know, faith alone in Christ alone, by grace alone, by grace through faith in Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. And what they did, however, compromise on is the following. And I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Um, what Peter was doing where he was uh, leaving the eating with Gentiles, he didn't want to be really be seen with the Gentiles because they were possibly eating food that had been sacrificed, leftover food from the party of the idol worship. 
And of course, Paul thinks, oh, it's not a big deal unless it causes someone to be offended. So they compromised and said, okay, don't eat any food that's uh, not drained of blood. So don't order it medium rare. <laughs> and eat meat not drained of blood or practice pagan marriage practices, you know, keep a single wife. So that's where Paul compromised. Even though he personally didn't buy this, he bought this, but he didn't buy the food part. He thought that was honestly a little bit of nonsense. But he was willing to compromise for the benefit of the brethren. And later on in his epistles, he speaks to it where he says, you know, it really doesn't matter, but then he also has great counsel. If we individually do something that causes our brother or sister to sin, maybe we should think twice about it. Even though by the letter of the law, it's not really wrong. But if it causes someone else to fall away, it's not good. So that's where Paul did support it, even though he knew it on the surface wasn't wrong. So can someone turn to, uh, to Acts 15, please, and read maybe down to... Let's see, let's start, I want to start right at the beginning. Um, maybe in verse 4 and take it through um, 11, 4 to 11. Chapter 15 of Acts. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised in order to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. So this, again, is where Luther ends up grabbing on to all of this, both from Acts and then also from Paul's epistles. On By grace, through faith, in Christ alone we are saved, and not by any works or any, really, marriage to the law. Marriage to the law of Moses, the ceremonial law, and so forth. So after this, then, I um, want to talk a little bit about Galatians, because when he gets to Antioch, he goes from Jerusalem back up to Antioch, and then he ends up writing his first letter, we think, from Antioch. You know, we don't know for sure, but that's where it's supposed. And this is the format that he uses. And uh, I've always found it interesting. I, uh, I think I mentioned this in a, a different uh, Bible class, but that I was always intrigued. Why does Paul always open most of his letters with um, grace, for, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and doesn't throw in the Holy Spirit? And, uh, and so we always had those discussions at Sim, and uh, the thought was is that the Holy Spirit is rather self-effacing, that he's implied that when Christ did his ministry on earth, the Holy Spirit was with him in ministry. He bore the Spirit, and then he released the Spirit on his death on the cross, um, figuratively and, and literally. Um, and that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, so when we talk about the Father and the Son, the Spirit is implied. Anyway. I was always rather curious. You know, why don't you say the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which, of course, is also in Scripture. But he tended to open his letters. You know, grace and, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a little bit of the thought behind it. So he always had, uh, he tended to have a, a, the name of the writer in the center in there, the name of who he's sending it to, you know, to the church in Galatia. Uh, then a greeting, like what I just mentioned. And, you know, peace, which is shalom, uh, the major Jewish greeting. And then he'd have thanks, his main body of the letter, a little bit about personal news, and it's sort of neat in some of the epistles. He'll say, and thank Tricius, and thank this one, and I want to thank this one, and here's what we're doing, and here's what's coming up, just like we would do in a letter. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd give them a blessing and a farewell. But how he did this without word processing and spell check, <laughs> I would continue to be amazed. Or even whiteout. You know, we talked about that a different time. I was wondering, 
Greg, back that up, will you? Let's change that. But I mean, the, the way the Greek is written, and when you have to diagnose Greek, it absolutely blows me away how unbelievably well written. Granted, guided by the Holy Spirit, so I guess we do have to keep that in mind. It was inspired. But it is rather incredible how well the prose is written. So that takes us to the letter of Galatians. And we're going to be going through a little bit of this uh, doctrinally. Uh, we think it's around 48 years after the death of Christ um, that this was written. Uh, and right before, actually, he went to Jerusalem, I sort of said he came back and wrote it, but he had written it before he went down there, we think. Um, it didn't have what he commonly puts in here. He didn't have personal news in there. And so, with the thought is, by those that have studied Galatians, that it's probably written in a bit of a hurry. Now, maybe he wanted to get down to Jerusalem, and he wanted to get something off to the churches. And he had left those churches in Turkey um, with appointed elders, and which might be like pastors of today. But he had set up churches in all those little towns where Christians were, you know, came to believe in him or believe in Christ, um, where they were Christians. And then he appointed somebody to be over them. And then later on, Timothy is sort of set to sort of cover a larger territory. But it's pretty neat how he started to organize the churches. He then talks about his doctrine in uh, Galatians 1 through 4 and some absolutely beautiful, beautiful language on Christian living in Galatians 5. Yes. If it's 48 years after Christ's death, how old is Paul? Good question. I think Paul died around 64 AD. If I... It's 48 AD. 48 AD. And Christ, and Christ died in what, 33, was it? Right, right, right. Because he was 33 years old. Well, he was 33, or 30 in the ballpark of 30 when he began his ministry. And you could say that he was likely close to 30-something A.D. because he was born four to six before Christ. And that's only because of the calendars. It really gets goofy to talk about that. Talk like that, doesn't it? Christ was born before Christ in a calendar standpoint. So four to six years before the, the calendar date of his birth is where it's thought that Christ was born. And then he began his ministry at age roughly age 30, and it roughly ran three years. So in the ballpark of probably A.D. 30, you know, in that ballpark, is where Christ would have died. And then, so 18 years after that would be Paul. And I have to think about how old Paul was. Because I think he, he I, um, I have to look back on that one. You know, let, let me bring that back. I just wondered if he was an older man or younger or yeah. whatever. He was a younger man compared to Peter. Uh, we know that. But I, I have, I'd have to look back and, and put it in perspective. Because I can't think of it. I don't know if I have any of the year of his birth. Give me just a second. Wikipedia says 5 AD. I don't know if that's right. Wikipedia's got to be right. <laughs> Wikipedia, so let it be written, so let it be done. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, that's probably about right. Five, 5 AD. So he would have been, you know, obviously 10 years or so, maybe younger than Christ. At Christ's death. So. That would put him, if Christ died at age 33 years old, um, he might be, what, 20s? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. We're checking Wikipedia. Our, actually, Wikipedia is pretty good, and uh, where you do have sources and references. Thank you for looking that up. So, uh, Galatia, what I'd like to do is go to... Uh, to Galatians 5 and read through 5, 1 through 6, 10. So before this, in the first part of Galatians 1 through 4, what Paul is doing is he's setting up his argument to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And his argument, first of all, to the Jews in the first four chapters is, uh, is that the law is no longer significant as it relates to ceremonial law. You know, in oral law, all the customs of the Jews, while of value and key to our heritage and our past, aren't relevant to their salvation. So he's trying to move the Jews off of being stuck to that law. And he begins in Galatians 5 talking about the freedom from the yoke of slavery to the law, to the burden of the law. So if we can begin with that, we'll try reading across it and, and take that through 6.10. Because it's about Christian living that applies to us. Therefore, 
be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. But there, excuse me, where, where are we? I'm sorry. Oh, we should be at uh, Galatians 5. Just one. Oh, I got That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Galatians 5 1. Yeah, go ahead. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Listen, I, Paul, I am telling you, what if you let yourself be circumcised? Christ will be of no benefit to you. Once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. You who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. You were running well who prevented you from obeying the truth. Such persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough. I am convinced confident about you in the Lord that you will not think otherwise but whoever it is that is confusing you will pay the penalty but my friends why am I still being persecuted if I am still preaching circumcision in that case the offense of the cross has been removed I wish those who unsettled you would consecrate themselves I mean castrate themselves it was a little bit direct there, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. If, however, you bite and indulge one another, Take care that you are not consumed by one another. Okay, we'll stop right there. Thank you. So we're going to begin with Walk by the Spirit, because that's a beautiful, uh, beautiful set of passages coming up here. Uh, but here you can see that you can get the implication on verse 15 that there were divisions in the Galatians churches that he left. They started arguing because the Judaizers had followed up, and they were really stuck on circumcision. They were stuck on other aspects of the law. And they begin, began to have a lot of divisions within their churches, battling each other. You know, should we be following the law of the Jews or not? So that kept cascading down. And uh, what we'd like to end with reading one last passage, and this is, I'll, I'll go back to, uh, to chapter 4 of Galatians. For when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption of sons. Very familiar passage to all of us. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Mm -hmm. And what Paul does so eloquently, and if you have a chance to read through Galatians, it doesn't take that long uh, to begin at Galatians 1 and read through it, is he starts contrasting uh, what God did through Abraham. And, and he talks about sonship a lot, not to be against anyone who is a female gender, sonship in simply the sense of the Middle Eastern pattern of passing on inheritance to the sons. So he was saying, we all become sons and daughters, the inheritance. And so he does that a lot beginning with Abraham, who we have become heirs of Abraham, and we become sons of God through the work of Christ. So with that, let's end with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, for the journeys that you put Paul through, that you led him through, uh, and how you took him as, a, as an advocate against the church to make him an advocate for Christ. 
please also return us to you during this Lenten season. And don't sever us from our Lord, but bring us close to our Lord, close to the grace that he only can give us in his name. Because faith works through love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Enjoy the rest of your week. God bless. And we'll get you the rest of chapter 3, where we'll be on to finishing up Galatians, and then we'll go into the chapter 4.